Welcome everybody. It is day two of the March Officer Club Clash. This is the second of three clashes who will determine who will compete at the ultimate in May. We've got that coming up, but for today we have your two semi-final matches. I am your host, Christo. I am joined by none other than our two-time defending world champion, J King. And Birdo, I don't have like, <laughs> a grand title for you. What, what do you want me to say? Um, I just discovered, all right, we've got Birdo, who uh, was formerly a resident of Rwanda. It's a pretty cool fact. <laughs> you could do a, the Ali Krumi strategy and say, Birdo, friend of Jaking. <laughs> I want to get away from that. I want you to be your own person, Birdo. I want you to stand alone. No shadow, now, even though we put Jaking right in the middle of the screen. You're important to me too, Birdo. Well, I'll just have to win the OCC Ultimate when it comes up. There you go. First ever OCC <laughs> Ultimate winner. It's a good title you can go with. Um, before we get into the action, let's take a look at the bracket. Let's see who will be competing here today in our semi-finals. Uh, we got Leo, who uh, took Jaking out 2-0, uh, going up against No in 5 who is no uh, stranger to the OCC. Uh, PyTorch taken on Birdo. So, uh, you know, you might not have a fancy title, but you will get to cast your own match, and that's not something you get to do every single day. So, uh, gonna be a lot of action going on here. Uh, first up, we are going to have Leo taken on uh, Noen. J King, since you did go head-to-head, uh, -head, as we saw yesterday, against Leo, any, uh, any insight into what, you know, Leo's kind of brought to the table here this weekend? I think Leo might have the strongest lineup uh, on paper going into this tournament. He has his Britain German discard, which is going to be quite strong into air, quite strong into really any traditionally aggressive um, mid-range deck. I suspect that deck's just going to be banned immediately. But then very interestingly, he has this Soviet France control deck, which I think is going to be very, very good against um, mid-range. Uh, going to be fine into Jaguar, it's going to be fine into air, and it's going to be able to hold its own into any um, competing control decks. Awesome. Um, let's. Why don't we actually just bring up the decks? Might as well be the yeah. easiest way to talk about this. Already dove into them. Uh, there you do have Leo's list. So, Jake King, why don't you continue your uh, your analysis and just dive into a little bit of the uh, the card selection here as well when it comes to what Leo's bringing? Of course. So his first deck here, and is actually the third deck that I hadn't mentioned yet, is his U.S. German mid range deck. Now, this is a pretty traditional um, list. This is a very common tournament list. Um, however. He does have a couple of tech cards in here. So he has one copy of the Flame Panzer, um, which is going to be quite strong in mirrors. It's going to be quite strong against air. Um, and looking at his lineup as a whole, he might not be wanting to ban air every single time. Like um, you might want to do, uh, other lineups might want to do, where you just want to get air off the table because air is going to be the deck to beat um, in any cards tournament. So this US mid-range list looking quite strong. Then his second list, I mentioned it before, it is the Britain German discard. And this list is actually very interesting for a couple of reasons, because this is a list where we've seen it appearing in the meta um, on ladder, but it's been built in wildly different ways because there's a lot of things you can do with this. And if you look at his list, he's not running any flam panthers. He's not running any sudden strikes. He's relying entirely on the power of supply shortage and root out the enemy as board clears. That it, He's perfectly fine if his opponent plays several unanswered one drops, two drops, three drops, because he's just going to have these very powerful AoEs that take them all out later in the game. And then he's investing his cards into these more expensive late game units that he can use to beat control decks like the Mosquito, the Wellington, the Lancaster, the Churchill Avery. And then last but not least, he has his Soviet France deck, which we've seen this one before. It's another tournament classic. It's a control deck that relies very heavily on its units, where you're just going to try to slowly build up a board and grind out a win over a long period of time. And, you know, J. King, you, uh, you initially mentioned, obviously, that Fredair, typically the, the deck that we see banned, and, and Leo deciding, hey, I'm going to go this different strategy and kind of go with the Brit German discard list. What what do you think kind of made him decide to go that direction um, instead of just bringing what we've seen tournament in and tournament out with Bird Air? So when you're talking about a deck and how good it is, when you're talking about something like laddering, you're going to be bringing air because it's faster. Uh, it beats a wider range of decks. However, when you're in a tournament where there's bands, there's only three decks your opponent is bringing, Britain German discard, I think, is 
easily equal to air, if not better than air as a tournament list, because air is going to be much easier to target. It's going to be the deck that everyone is going to target if they're going to target a deck. Whereas the Brit German Discard, it's sort of new on the scene. People haven't figured out exactly how to play against it, exactly how to tech against it. And if at the end of the day, if it just gets a ban, it gets a ban in the same way air might have gotten a ban. So actually, I think this is a very uh, smart decision by him to bring this Brit German Discard deck. Plus, once you get to the um, you know the finals or the third place match where you don't actually get a ban, uh, as you mentioned, folks are expecting the Brit Air list that we've seen time in and time out. This is something a little bit different that they may not have prepped for. So uh, very curious to see how this performs as we go through uh, the rest of this event. Uh, why don't we bring up No Win's lists and uh, and Berto, why don't you have uh, take us through them? Sure, Finn. So here, of course, we start out with pretty close to the classic Brit air list, but there's a few things different with this one. No one really loves his one copy of the 26 engineer regiment to buff the health of uh, all of his air units, um, which can be really powerful if he gets ahead on the board. Same with these things like naval supply run, and you got a lot of draw in this deck to find all those pieces and put them together. Nice comeback potential in the Empire Strikes. I don't need to really say more about it. It's pretty classic. <laughs> it does the job. Um, nobody's unfamiliar with the deck. Um, and then he has Heinz, which is something we haven't really seen much in the tournament scene recently, but it is still a very fast deck, especially if you can get the early Greif and the Nakshub. Um, which no one knows how to do, I think, <laughs> when I've played against him on ladder. And I've seen some screenshots from Jaking too, who has had quite a few run-ins with this deck on ladder. He's very successful with it. He might be the most experienced Heinz player out there. Um, and he, he knows how to put the pressure on. And with the triple Blitzkriegs, you have to respond really early if you don't want to be in danger of losing the game very early on. Um, and then he has a Soviet US, a little bit of a ramp list, a little bit of a control list, and doesn't go too heavy into the ramp. It just runs four copies of War Machines, one copy of War Bonds, uh, which I think is quite smart. You have a lot of really high value four drops in this deck with the fifth Rangers, the T60s, and the first rifles. So you don't necessarily need to be playing War Machine into hour of need. You can just say, I War Machine, I get out fifth rangers on turn three, and then I keep doing my control stuff, and that's pretty dang good. Uh, so I think this deck is pretty good. Um, it has nice guards. The one weakness is that it struggles a little bit with healing, with the only healing in the deck being 329th Engineer Battalion, so that could cause some issues against aggro. So, so based on no one's deck lineup, we heard, you know, J King talk about how that Brit discard list would probably be the go-to ban. Would you agree uh, with that, Berto? Yeah, I would tend to agree with that. Um, it has quite a few good tools against the air deck. Um, even though the air has so much draw, uh, discard still ends up being quite good into it. Uh, and you also force... <laughs> the air player into these decisions where like maybe i can play a convoy but it's so much worse on tempo than my other options that i'd rather do first but if i don't play it then i'm risking getting my draw discarded which is so much worse um so that sort of thing puts no one into a difficult spot um and then with the hinds you have even less draw to begin with and your martyrs which are a big part of your draw you're not even going to get many trades in with because the deck doesn't run a whole ton of units. Um, and you only have one Enigma, which can win the game on the spot if it that's if it's not getting discarded and you play it to draw seven, but that's that's very wishful thinking. And uh discard is even pretty good into ramp because you can let your opponent play out things like the war machine, which don't immediately do anything and then start hitting their hand to hit the higher value targets. Um, so I think Brit Discard is quite a, a reasonable ban here. 
it might not be quite as good as air into that Soviet US deck, but overall, I think it's quite good into his lineup. Right on. And then, you know, Jake King, if we're looking at the other way around, if you're in Leo shoes, what are you looking at banning on no inside? I think if you're Leo, looking at just the deck lists, I think you are leaning towards banning the Heinz or um, the Soviet control list because you have a lineup that's fine against air. However, if you're Leo, I think you are 100% confident your discard is being banned. So you should be considering with my two other decks, with my US midrange and the Soviet France control, which of these three decks do I not want to play against? And I think air might eke up there where it's it's just a deck that even if you have good decks into it, it's still a deck that can get wins. And I think you're perfectly fine going against Heinz with both of your decks. The Soviet control list, it's a little hard to say because it's a deck that can perform very, very well or very, very poorly because it doesn't have a lot of card draw. So if you just hit things in slightly the wrong order, uh, it can very easily be overwhelmed. However, it can also hit things in the perfect order and absolutely crush you. Um, so honestly, I think Leo's in a very comfortable spot where he could easily ban any three of the decks. I think Heinz is the worst deck in no one's lineup against Leo's lineup, but he could even ban Heinz, and I think he would still be favored in the series. So I think Leo's really in a comfortable spot here because of his lineup. Well, then let's dive in and find out exactly what got banned here before we get into the first semifinal of uh, of OCC Clash Saturday. So we do see Leo's uh, Brit discard deck get banned, and then and then the Heinz deck. Look at that. So um, I guess we'll have to determine if that was the right course of action here. Uh, I think to your point, J. King, just felt like Leo was probably in a good spot regardless of what he ended up banning. Yeah, and I think, honestly, um, Leo's lineup is very strong, and Leo as a player is very strong, but he is not a tournament regular, and there is something to be said about um, the experience you get from regularly playing in tournaments. So you could be very good at the game and have very, very good decks, and you build a good lineup, but if you're not experienced playing in these tournaments, it can be very easy to make mistakes in things like the ban. Um, and not necessarily saying that it is a mistake, it could just be that it's known. Ban the deck he's most comfortable on and force him to play on the other two things. Um, there is definitely an argument for banning Heinz, but I think exclusively on paper, I think the Heinz deck is by far the weakest of uh, no one's three decks into Leo's lineup. I find it uh, really funny, J. King, how you talk about being comfortable going into no one after banning the air deck. I don't think I've ever once... I would never have described myself as comfortable against playing no one. He is... <laughs> <laughs> he is, I mean, a titan of the tournament scene. He's been in a whole ton, and he's he's taken so many games off of me that I thought I had a really strong position. Um, and if you're Leo, you're a little newer to tournaments. I I mean, I'm, I would be very scared. Yeah, that is true. You can never, no one has won in so many times in situations where on paper, he had absolutely no business winning. Um, and we see he's gotten the war machine out early. He's hit the Briance, um regiment. He's got it to the, um, front line, which is going to be slow down Leo's front line deck immensely. And looking at No One's hand, it's exactly what you want to see. He's got that first rifles. He's got the partisans Ural factories in case there's something scary that comes out. The T60 is going to generate more units, which is going to make up for the fact that he doesn't have a lot of card draw uh, in his deck and zero in hand currently. All right, and Leo here, I think quite smartly, is not playing this last 30 second because no one does run two copies of Scorched Earth in his deck. Which, if you get four units Scorched Earth as frontline around turn five, you are in a world of hurt. So I think very smart to, uh, to hold back a little bit to play around that possibility. Yeah, it is. It is also worth noting that on, on this turn, because he went for the attacking with the combat engineers instead of playing that 30 second, um, it, the smoke screen is off the combat engineers now. Um, but it also means no one is now capable of trading this Briance Regiment into any of the three units on board. And despite it not dealing any damage, the destruction effect 
will destroy any of the units. So he, he could remove this combat engineers now if he wants. He decides he wants to remove the 35G, it being a tank, the lowest operation cost unit, and the highest stat unit on the board. I think that's fair. Just really quickly, I wanted to say I was wrong. Uh, no one actually does not run Scorched Earth in this deck at all. I was confusing that with another deck list that I had read during the tournament, another Soviet control. So, so in that case, I'm not entirely sure why he wouldn't play out the 32nd there. Well, he had used all of his credits um, attacking with the combat engineers rather than choosing to play out the fourth unit. It is possible to get Stars and Stripes in mind because no one does run one copy of Stars and Stripes. Ooh. And yes. it is a single copy, but if it takes out all of your units on turn four, turn five, uh, that's quite a big deal. And we see Leo's one copy of Flampanzer coming out and destroying Noen's only one cost unit in the deck and the only healing in his deck, Engineers. So 21 is going to be the health total Noen has to work with for the rest of this game unless he manages to get another Engineers off of Heroes of the Soviet Union. However, that is 20 health worth of guards in his hand at the moment. So uh, I don't think <laughs> <laughs> no one is too worried about dying anytime soon. Yeah, you don't have a lot of draw with this deck. Although something like uh, the train is really able to get out a lot of value. And if you're pumping out value every turn with this kind of card, you don't necessarily need draw to come ahead. You can just keep your engine running, so to speak. Uh, although Hellcat is a good answer for it, but it will not, he does not have the credits to trade in with the Hellcat this turn. And this is really no one is showing exactly how you need to play against this US frontline deck, is you keep them penned into their own support line, keep them f having to spend credits just playing cards and throwing them at your own units. and. You're going to force them to make inefficient trades. You're going to make them do things like spending two credits moving up a Flam Panzer to just have it immediately die. Um, and if he keeps doing this, Leo's not going to be able to buff things with the 99th Infantry. He's not going to be able to draw with the Shermans. He's going to have fewer units and fewer room to play units for the cards like we can do it. Here he can finally take out the Armored Train if he wants, However, that will mean he is not drawing with Sherman. So he now has to make some pretty important decisions on how he wants to play this turn and the next few turns moving forward. Yeah, this is his first opportunity to play Sherman for draw of this game, I believe. And that's when he draws the Sherman. Um, but yeah, as you said, it it's not auto, oh, I can play Sherman, I'm playing it wipe my hands of the whole situation when no one is getting constant value from this train. So the question you really have to ask yourself is, am I consistently getting the front line back enough if I play the Hellcat this turn and kill the train? And that is actually a very good question because with this Hellcat in hand, you are not worried about the armored train moving to the front line, which might otherwise be a very huge threat and capable of holding it for turns and turns and turns against other things. However, um, Armored Train to the front line just immediately dies to Hellcat, so he actually chooses to just get the value out of the 99th now. He floats two credits. However, he is setting up this um, T-34 trading into the Whirlwind, and this is going to prevent anything like a B-17. It's going to prevent a um, 272nd, and it's going to buy him enough time to either move up his 99th, draw with Sherman, or if the uh, Armored Train moves forward, he can then just use the Hellcat, kill it off for significantly less credits, and then enough, enough credits afterwards to push up the 99th and another, another Whirlwind and get much more control over the board as a whole to set up these Shermans and we can do it. Oh my, and no one, he has so little draw in this deck, but he finds the single copy of Mobilization and triple sickle to give him things to do, give him more resources, and I think that puts him into a really good spot. And here you see Leo now does not trust that he was going to be able to take the front line in the future turns if he just trades off this armored train. So he allows Noen to get an additional uh, light infantry 
at the cost of Leo finally drawing with the Sherman, getting the new cards into his hand. The fifth Ranchers pickup is going to be very big. The second Hellcat pickup is going to be very big. A little awkward this turn. You don't want to trade a 5-1 into a 2-2, but you don't have a lot of other options. You can Partisans the Sherman to value trade and Red Banner. You can also do this, which also looks really nice. A little bit worse into uh, Stars and Stripes, but it's only one copy in the deck, and it's by f no means a blowout if you got Stars and Stripes here. Yeah, just taking Leo's 22nd Infantry, and it's now working for Noen. This is actually quite hilarious. Noen is using Leo's frontline tools with control of the frontline himself to uh, <laughs> do draw <laughs> in his deck that does have limited draw. However, you cannot count Leo out. Frontline is not a deck that just rolls over and dies, especially not with this hand. He's going to have a lot to work with for several more turns. However, just looking at the sheer amount of value in no one's hand, it is very difficult to imagine how Leo is going to be able to create um, some sort of miracle comeback in this game. I don't really see it. No one can do the B17 Ural Factory's combo this turn if he wants. Um, doesn't look great. You're probably looking for a higher value target. He chooses to just get out the Tractor Factories. And that's the thing about Frontline is if you can just push all of these units to the Frontline, they're essentially safe. They have to be traded off because the only real clears are Stars and Stripes and Strategic Bombing, which only affect the support line. So just using Tractor Factories, push it to the Frontline. These things are here to stay. Now, I agree that Leo has to go for these 8-8 uh, Fifth Rangers to try and take back control of this game, but he only has the one. No one has the Partisans, if he really wants to, to keep another 5-5 five five in his front line around. Uh, and then what can Leo really do? The weakened duets in his hand are not doing a lot, because most of his things just aren't getting to a good health breakpoint. The half track and the Hellcat, they're only going up to five defense, which is just not useful in the situation when you're going up against five fives. And no one just has really so many choices this turn. He can just even trade out with his two units and play more slow infantry. He can play a first rifles. He can do Heroes of the Soviet Union, look for something big. Or he can trade into the Whirlwind and slam the B-17. He has a lot of choices. He chooses to go all face, the Noen Classic, even when he's playing a control deck. He's pushing <laughs> everything face. And this is putting the pressure onto Leo. Noen's hand, he has the ability to come back. If, even if by going face, he's losing tempo when he's allowing Leo to come back on board. It doesn't matter. Look at Noen's hand. He has two Partisans, a B-17. He, he can do anything. Next turn, he can even go for the... Um, 50-50 to get a Pershing, you can go 50-50 to get a B-17F is the other option. Uh, while destroying a unit, he can save the Ural Factories for the Partisans. If Leo ever takes the front line with a large unit, it is under the threat of being taken and killing himself with it. Sometimes I find, when I have so many cards in hand and so many options, I think, how can I lose this game? And it's a lot harder to calculate all the lines that you might lose over the next eight turns, then over the next two. So I, I don't mind the hitting the HQ here. Um, he has so many options. He has these confusions, these partisans, um, which also really threaten Leo, even if he can somehow take control of the front line. If it's only one or two units, the Partisans can mean more damage to the HQ. And he is going to be able to take control of the front line this turn and draw with Sherman. However, looking at his health total, that is very, very low. And he is not quite at the credits for lethal here. However, it's getting close. Yeah, and there are some good six-cost U.S. units if no one wants to go for the Partisans. And, oh, sorry, not six-cost, they're five-cost units if he wants to go for the 
partisans and Euro factors. No red banner in hand. Hitting the 2 2, probably the worst target on the board. However, this right now he has a 50 50 for lethal. This Euro factory on the B17 will either give him, give him a Persian, which is just going to be an 8 8 tank, which you've seen both Hellcats played. It's essentially going to be unkillable, or you just win the game. And no one deciding that he's in a good enough position, he doesn't even have to go for the 50 50 to win the game. He's just going to trade out the Red Devils, play it slower. And. Well, I think this maybe is a missed opportunity from no one. It really doesn't matter. There's, he's not giving Leo any options to come back in this game, because what is Leo really supposed to do against this board? He can't make a large unit in the front line to try to hold it, because he, it just dies. He dies to partisans if that happens. He can't do a wide board, because then partisans just trades off the two units. And he's also at six, so he needs to deal with the units currently on board. It's almost one of those situations where you want to say, if I think no one only has a few cards left in his deck, maybe 12, 14. Sometimes you just say, well, if he has one of two partisans, I die. I have to try to make the winning line, not the not losing line. Yeah, um, Leo doesn't know no one's hand. So from Leo's perspective, no one's hand could be two more war machines, two more Briansk regiments, and two Ural factories. And it's completely dead, and he just, if Leo is capable of responding to what's currently on board, he's going to be perfectly fine. However, we know that that's not true. But from Leo's but perspective, sometimes that's he's what much you more, gotta hope for. <laughs> yeah, from his perspective, he's much more in this game than the reality is. He finds the half track, which is going to let him survive for another turn. And he uses the dive bombing to kill the yak which it wouldn't have been effective in drawing no in a card this turn because he would have simply overdrawn it um but it does present the two damage um leo also had the opportunity to instead use the dive bombing on the b17 to deny that really powerful deployment effect from triggering again um but he did need to deal with both of those units this turn if he doesn't want to die to Partisans. Which he did. And a really poor 5-drop for this situation. <laughs> I mean, it's better than the uh, Invader, the 4-4 Bomber, but a 2-3 Artillery is <laughs> not great. And, I mean, no one just deciding he wants to drop Leo to 2, and this will make the second Partisans in hand It'll make it much, much harder for Leo to play in a way that keeps him alive. He also gets another T60 on the board, which is going to generate another Blitz tank. And at any point, if he feels like the game is slipping from him, he has the option of doing B17 Euro Factory, and 50% of the time he wins the game on the spot. So I will bring up, no one has used his only copy of Confusion, and he's used one Partisans. If you get the We Can Do It down this turn, you get two units to the front line, you're you're not going to be dead to partisans. Which I think is very important here. Ooh, but this doesn't leave you alive to partisans. No, it does not. And I mean even if he had a second unit in the front line, this T60, with the amount of credits no one has available, he would have been able to trade off the T60 and kill him with the T34. It was just an impossible task for Leo, and he played it perfectly. He was very, very, very close to getting over the hump, but just not quite enough, and no one takes it and gets a 1-0 lead over Leo. Yeah, I certainly don't blame Leo for going for that line there. It's, it's the winning line if your opponent doesn't have partisans, and... At that stage in that game, it's really hard to uh, play around Partisans and still have much of a chance at all. And now Leo has to prove that his ban decision was correct because he now has to beat Brit Air twice in a row. And, I mean, that is a tough order. This hand right now is looking quite good for it. Skytrain's a very good card because it's going to protect your other units in the support line from the attacks of Bombers. Flampanzer, it's a one of in your deck, and it's going to essentially just be killing a swordfish. Uh, Half-track's another great option to return buffed planes to 
the hand of the Brit player while generating you quite a bit of tempo, and 35T is going to be able to reach the support line, which most of your other slower cards can't do. However, despite this being a really good hand, he misses the one-cost unit to start with, a 32nd, a Red Devils, a Combat Engineers, which means no one is taking a very, very early dominant control of the board. Yeah, you might think, well, how much does it even matter to have the 30 seconds in this matchup because they're just getting traded out by the bomber anyways? However, the one credit per turn that no one has to spend on the bomber significantly slows down his development uh, f over the first few turns. It's it's a whole war machine ha having to of difference. Leo chooses to destroy the Type 93 rather than the Swordfish in this situation. And, I mean... Can you explain this play, Berto? Because... Oh, well, I, I certainly understand where it's coming from, because it's taking off the most damage from the board. You're just... You're at such low health so early on, you have few options in your hand. Uh, the ones... The options in your hand are... Direct damage to the backline, though, with these 35 T's. Um, and half track also a good option for these bombers in the backline. I, I I'm with Leo on this one. I think that was a good call to keep his uh HQ defense high. Um, All right. Well, I have to say I still disagree with you and Leo on this, but um I was knocked out of the first round, so <laughs> Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. And here, no one has to make the decision of, does he start to use these high-tempo cards in air to remove Leo's board, or does he commit to how he's been playing so far, which is just go all face? And, I mean, that's how no one likes to play his games. And sometimes it works out great, but, I mean, if he just continues to go all face... It's not going to work out great for him in this game because Leo has the tools to respond to no one's board and no one does not have the tools to close out a game. So he does choose to go for the Parisi, take the trade on the half track, and he's killing the smaller unit here because although the half track is a 2-2 compared to a 3-3, the one operation cost difference is very huge. It's going to cost Leo four credits to try to get this flame panzer to the support line. And you know why he can't go face? Because he took out the Type 93. <laughs> uh, and now all of a sudden, no one is put into a very precarious position. Um, you can get down the Aichi, and that's pretty good that you're going to have the 3-2 body next turn, most likely. Um, but you're not really getting the full value out of the Aichi if you're not using both halves and if you're just letting the first half getting trade out and here we see although it looked it looked good for him at the turn at the time he did it where he chose to take out the half track rather than this flam panzer something this three two body is uh you're certainly wishing that this was a two one and you still had your gladiator on the front or uh, in the front line things have really taken a turn for the worse by choosing to go for that half track play over the flam panzer and I mean, Leo, with another 35T in hand, he can't remove the Aichi completely, and this is the power of the Aichi, is it's very difficult for decks like US Midrange to take out entirely, but no one, this Raph isn't going to necessarily be doing a lot against Leo, and this Convoy, drawing two cards is good, but drawing two cards is three credits of not developing the board, and if Leo can get a few more turns, a few more credits of board development, he's just going to be able to lock no one out with this we can do it, build a huge board that is un unkillable to Empire Strikes, and just is the nail in the coffin for the game. However, I do feel like it is important to note that you are going to have to accept a few turns of almost just losing to the Empire Strikes. It is such a powerful card, particularly in combination with the stickiness of the Aichi. And right on curve, no one finds a Lend Lease. He would rather see an Empire Strikes here, and he might not even play the Lend Lease. If he chooses not even to draw with the Convoy, he's just going to play entirely on tempo, plays out the Wrath, kills the 35T in the front line. And... We'll see if this works out for him. This Raph is as good as dead, and 
he's on the following turn he'll have eight credits he still can't attack with the ig and lend lease so i'm not i don't necessarily agree with no one on this line i don't think this really gets him anywhere he's forcing leo to spend credits to answer with the raf the units he's played out on the board but it costs leo less credits to answer this than no one invested into it and if you look at the hand size right now leo has eight cards in hand and no one has two um so even though leo's on half health Half health is a very, very far distance away from being dead uh, when your hand is looking the way no one's hand is looking right now. It is just so scary, the possibilities of no one's hand, though. If you find a Monty, if you find the Empire Strikes, Leo's game plan can unravel very quickly. Uh, there's no way you can play we can do it this turn because you need to still be answering these units. But this Skytrain is going to do a really good job, and it's almost as if he's summoning them. <laughs> no one finds the Convoy, which is going to allow him to do two Convoys, still drawing four cards. However, with two credits left over rather than one <laughs> of the lend -lease. And, I mean, he went from two cards in hand to now five cards in hand with an additional ten draw in hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean... He is it... not limited by card draw, but he is limited by credits. Um, that's one of the difficulties that can come up with Bridair, is sometimes you find none of the draw, and you have all these credits, you're floating on all these turns, and sometimes you find all the draw, and you just don't have the other tools in your hand to deal with the board. Yeah, right Around now, when you need it. No one would much rather this lend -lease be an HMS Illustrious and this convoy be an Empire Strikes. <laughs> he would much, much rather that, and we see Leo getting out the we can do it, getting control of the front line, and... I mean, it is so uphill from now on for no one because Empire Strikes, the number of bombers needed to take out this board with Empire Strikes is three, and it, that's not even going to clear everything. It's only going to clear um, three of the five units, and no one has no Empire Strikes and no bombers in hand. <laughs> <laughs> so he chooses to play the Convoy um, because he... Most likely because he drew that Raph, he sees that he's going to have an efficient play that turn. Um, but two Gladiators off the Convoy, not really what you're looking for. It's going to be fine alongside this close air support, because these Gladiators, they're going to deal damage if it's packed into. They're going to be threatening Leo. They're not blocked by the Skytrain. However, no one's not able to take out any of Leo's units. And this Blitzkrieg that's just been sitting in Leo's hand, he drew it pretty early on into the game, and it's been a completely dead card. But suddenly, this Blitzkrieg is going to come alive, and it is going to be potentially just lethal damage. And with the Greyhound pickup, that is threatening... Um, doing some quick math here, 12 from the Blitzkrieg. 7, that's lethal. Greyhound... Uh, Hellcat Blitzkrieg is just lethal for Leo. No one has been uh, dominating the board the entire game, and Leo's just fought his way back slowly but surely, has got his way back into this game without attacking no one once, and this is just lethal damage. And it looks like he sees it. He takes the time, he does the math. Greyhound to the front line, Hellcat to the front line, Blitzkrieg for 12 damage and 4 free credits. And that's just game. Yeah, well, when your opponent spends nine credits over two turns drawing and not much else, uh, it, it puts you into a good spot <laughs> in a tempo-based matchup. Who would have yeah. thought? And Leo takes it, so he ties it up 1-1, one, one, and we go into game three, which is Noen on his air deck again. Uh, this time, Leo has a slightly harder task, winning with his Soviet France control. Now, this is certainly um, different than the days of old of this matchup, Soviet control versus Brit Air being probably 95% favored for Air. Uh, this matchup, because of cards like Chaika, like Spyring into um, particularly the Reich research, Defend in Depth is able to target Air units, unlike uh, Hammers in other soviet decks that can only target ground units this is going to be a much harder matchup than uh soviet control has been in the past for no one but it's definitely still favored for the air player however this hand it's not bad um because the soviet control deck is a little slower it's no one is perfectly fine missing a one drop 
And he has the important cards, HMS Illustrious, Empire Strikes. These are very key cards. And lend to refill your hand. You're not going to be too worried about running out of cards early in this matchup. Although the Empire Strikes, I would argue, is not as key in this matchup compared to a lot of others, such as that US mid-range game that we just saw before, because Leo has so many things that just have such high defense that you're not really getting a lot, even if you're dealing three or four to all the units. Sometimes. There are, of course, situations where it's huge, but against I... this Chaika and this Briansk, it's not looking immediately incredibly good. That is true, and Leo decides to just uh, play the Spy Ring, gets British Research, which is probably the worst in this situation. Uh, and in generally speaking, the one you least want to get. I'll um, tell you, 39th is pretty good, though. Yep. You'll take that any day of the week. And Noen has a few key differences in his deck. He's not running the Sonyas, he's running the Type 93s, which means he has less bombers overall uh, in favor of these attack buffs. He's much more aggressive. He has two naval supply runs in there. And, I mean, that's very good if you have a powerful explosive opening of to close out the game faster. However, if you're staring down a Chaika and a Soviet control player at full health, not as good as, say, the Sonya would be, um, where it's just another bomber buff to buff the Empire Strikes. This Type 93 is a little flimsy. No one is going to get through the Chaika, and he does have these powerful units, but here comes the 39th. The Yak 9 draw Ooh. on curve might even stop the 39th play because a 4 5 fighter is going to uh, just. I mean, 4-5 fighter into these two um, bombers. No one has to make some decisions. He can oh. go for the naval supply run trade. If I'm no one, I think I'd probably do swordfish and naval supply run. <laughs> Even and, though it's going to get so blown out by the 39th. But it's so hard to play around. Because and your deck no is one, built around buffing these bombers. And no one chooses not even to play the swordfish. He'd rather 5 damage face than another bomber on board. And that's going to be hard to punish when the only bomber on board is stolen to kill the other unit. Loses Monty. That's... He, he's probably fine with that. That's uh, it's not, not the worst one to lose, but it is one of the best cards in the game. <laughs> yeah, and he's scrambling to rebuild this board, but uh, I mean, that five damage face is looking a lot worse now than it did uh, two turns ago, one turn <laughs> ago even. So Leo here, I mean, he can just take out the gladiator, push up the five five. Um, he's not quite able to take out the Swordfish with the other defendant depth, but he'll have the credits left over to do what he wants. He decides he wants to Radar, not going to do any synthetic rubber shenanigans in this game, and he oh, Radars into no. the 52k, which is going to let him clear no one's board. Uh, and that is brutal. <laughs> Absolutely brutal for no one. And, I mean, it's brutal, but he's getting punished. I mean, he played in a way. He took these risks, and these are the punishes. He knows what's in his opponent's deck. He knows uh, that this could happen, and unfortunately for him, it is happening. All right, Raph is a very good pickup, though, because when you bounce the Swordfish, it's going to go back to no one's own hand, because he was the owner of the card. It goes to his hand, which starts to enable these uh, the Empire Strikes, which seem really important from this spot for him to be able to come back. And we do also have to consider um, that the potential effect of Tilt on no one by this point in the game, because that is your opponent's only Yak top decked on turn 5, and that is your opponent's only 52k drawn off the radar. <laughs> uh, that, I mean, that's unfortunate and that has got to be um, something that no one is considering. And I know no one is actually probably one of the most calm and collected players in the entire cards competitive scene. Um, from his perspective, if you win a game, you played well. If you lost a game, you made mistakes. It, it doesn't really matter how it happened. Um, so from his perspective, maybe that's not really getting to him. And I mean, Raf the Swordfish back to hand, Albacore to pin the 39th, cast to protect these units looking okay from no one's perspective but 
lend lease has been played convoy has been played he's out of draw in hand and what's currently in hand does not look like it's going to be enough to close out this game i don't know even a monk i think would be pretty upset in a game where your opponent has two defend in depths the one copy of 39th the yak and a copy of chaika i Maybe I'm. Maybe that's just me. I have a hard time seeing how it doesn't get to you. Um, and yeah. it's and... it's so hard. And the thirty. I I didn't even remember to mention the fifty two k. It's it's so brutal to have all these tools that are particularly good in this matchup. And no one here has some options uh is likely going to be going for the sexton in the second cast um but he his bombers have been dropping like flies he had a huge number of bombers several turns ago but every time he plays one leo is sure to immediately take it off and these two empires of strikes looking a lot worse than they were maybe two turns ago or they do in the average uh game you play against bread uh chooses to actually just damage the uh briansk irregulars it Not seems like he's playing around the possibility of finding more bombers in this situation. With that sort of line, versus playing the cast and value trading, or um, simply destroying the 5-4, I, I, I mean, have to imagine that's his consideration. That's his hope. Or even just the backup plan of playing both the Empire Strikes. Although that would, if he plans to play both the Empire Strikes, you would think killing the yeah, three kill by first rifles would be a little bit better than getting the damage onto this Briansk. And here comes the Scorched Earth, which is actually hitting more of Leo's own than no one's, but I mean, Leo doesn't care. His units don't necessarily need to attack. He's perfectly fine. His unit's just clogging up board space and, I mean, starving no one of room. And Leo just going to develop this 272nd with two phony boys in hand. Yeah, and Leo is probably a little bit precautious to play phony war when everyone knows that Brit Air has these incredible comeback mechanics. You don't really want to feed your opponent those tools. I can't imagine you want to play the swordfish here. Yep, looks like he just misclicked the swordfish. Said, nope, definitely don't want to play that. But really? No, he's considering it. And this Scorched Earth has put him in such an awkward situation because he can no longer just trade off this Type 94 for free, hit in this raft for two credits to just make room on his board. He is really stuck with these units now, and um potentially being punished for his choices um uh, in previous turns of hitting this briance going for this blind he's going to be able to attack with the sexton and he goes face he's just deciding if i'm winning this game it's through an hms illustrious double empire strikes and naval supply run go all phase draw wellington draw all of the bursts i need to close out this game i am not winning on board um that's what no one is saying and honestly i think he's probably correct um, so the Sexton can be killed here, and that will free back up the 39th in the front line, which will need to be dealt with. I mean, or you can ignore it, but how and much does that do? Leo taking the very aggressive line of just getting two uh, Stalins on the board, and developing the Night Witches, taking out the Type 93. And this is in a very aggressive line from Leo, because he's seen the Monty be discarded. He knows the Monty is gone. However, Shelling is still in the deck. If there's a Shelling here, and no one goes face for another 10, um, or even... He's not quite at the credits to do Shelling Naval Supply Run, but he can do shell and go face for another four and develop a swordfish and if you're looking at leo's hand it's not doing anything like he doesn't want to play winter offensive because it won't even kill the sexton it will take out his only guard 
and it will deal four damage to him. Leo taking maybe a much more risky line than he actually needs to, seeing no one's hand, because Leo doesn't know what is in no one's hand. He doesn't know if, as soon as the void slots get freed up, if there's going to be four bombers, two empire strikes, everything's cleared, he's taking 10 damage, and there's a huge board of unkillable bombers suddenly. He's just saying, I want to end the game next turn, unless you have shelling. It's a one card in your deck, do you have it? And no one does not have it. He's able to take out one of these tanks, but that's not going to be enough, is it? He's alive on board for now because no one or Leo does not have enough credits to attack yeah. with everything <laughs> necessary and play winter offensive because of this. Yeah, one credit off. Yeah, one credit off if he plays the winter offensive, one damage off if he goes for four attacks. Um, chooses to leave the sexton up. Interesting. I would like that play a lot more if this research had found him either a radar or the U.S. military research to give yourself a little more protection. And um, one other thing that I wanted to mention about uh, the last turn from Leo with just leaving his zero two guard in the back line. No one doesn't run a single copy of Air Superiority, which I think is quite unusual for this list. Yeah, it's zero Air Superiority, zero Sonia. And I mean, this is what happens when you take this aggressive line with this deck, and no one has done the math. He sees Empire Strikes doesn't fully clear, and that's it. He concedes, and Leo takes it. 2-1, beating Air twice in a row. Very convincingly. So there you see the bracket. Leo t defeating Noen 2-1. Two to one. And, uh, you know, at the end of that first game where we were talking a little bit about how Noen is the tournament vet, you know, he made that decision to go a little bit more aggressive at that sort of turning point, uh, putting the pressure on. And sometimes that's the advantage of being that tournament player, of knowing when, hey, I'm playing a control deck, but I need to push versus sitting back. But... Uh, you know, once we got into that second and third game, Leo really did look like he turned it up and kind of took control of, of that matchup. Yeah, and despite despite no one being this veteran, being arguably the favorite um, just in terms of player strength, I think Leo c convincingly played um, better than no one did in those three games. Even in the game he lost, I felt um, Leo still had a very strong grasp of the game. He still had a very strong idea of what he needed to do to win, how the cards he was playing around. And there's an interesting stat I'd like to bring up here. This is Leo's second ever appearance in any form of OCC. His one other appearance, he won the tournament. So <laughs> <laughs> Leo showing that he doesn't necessarily need to show up often, but he shows up to win. Um, and I mean, no one has his own fair share of uh, top placements. I think he's been in 18 OCCs, um, but he will have to battle it out for potentially another third place finish where Leo goes on to the finals. Welcome back, everybody. We have the second semi-final for you. We've got PyTorch taking on our very own Birdo Burrito. Uh, before we get to you, Birdo, though, um, yesterday we did not get to see PyTorch's uh, player profile. Unfortunately, Admirable dropped from the tournament, and therefore uh, we did not see the matchup at all. So let's bring up PyTorch's profile, take a quick peek. Um, I will end up putting Jaking on the spot at the end of this profile since he's the, uh, the card stat guy. So um, as I run through this card, think about any fun stat you may have about PyTorch. Uh, no pressure at all. Um, so we see last season 399 total matches, uh, 247 wins for a 61.9% win rate. That allowed uh, PyTorch to finish 26th in the season, did end up going through the qualifiers, so got here the hard way, but uh, went up against Dare Admirable, who unfortunately had to drop, and that got the free pass into the semifinals. Uh, Jaking, any fun stat about PyTorch? I don't have really any funny, fun stats about PyTorch because I've never seen him before about a month ago he competed and actually made it into the top 16 of the 
open. Um, where unfortunately he did not make it into the top four. He didn't make it to stream, but he was in the top 16 of the open. So he got through one of the qualifiers and he got into top 38 and then he got through the OCC qualifiers. So you have to be wondering how many of those 399 games are tournament games. This guy has showed up and showed up to play. He has installed cards and just said, I'm, I'm here to win. Um, and he's in the semifinals already of his, as far as I'm aware, first OCC qualifier, wins the qualifier, makes it to the top eight, and now he's into the semifinals. So if this lovely individual is here to play, let's take a look at what kind of heat this person is bringing. Uh, you know, Birdo, I'll have you walk through your own deck list in a minute. I feel like that's just fitting. Uh, so J King, why don't you walk us through what PyTorch is bringing here today? All right. So um, not too surprising, and especially from somebody who is newer to the game, has a smaller collection, and is um, potentially just playing the decks that they see other people playing in tournaments. That's typically where most people start off with. Uh, PyTorch is bringing Britain, Japan, Air. And this is going to be the very, very traditional list. Um, looking through it, one Wrath, one Naval Supply Run, two IG, three Air Sup, two Sonyas. This is essentially card for card the list with maybe one or two differences that I would expect most players to be playing. Um, we're pushing into these top 10 positions on ladder. And then we look over at the second deck. Again, not too surprising. It is Japan German Feigned Retreat Aggro. This is a lot of players' first competitive decks that they build. Um, this is looking like a very traditional version of it. It is the three order version with the bombing raid. So Berto will be happy about that. Um, <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> Except uh, I will note that they said their favorite card was the Heinkel. The uh, three cost can only attack HQ's bomber from Germany. They are not running that card in their deck, so very disappointed. Um, but to me, the very surprising part about PyTorch's lineup is their third deck. It's the Soviet France Control. Now, this is a deck that we've seen before in tournaments, but it's certainly not an easy deck to pick up. It's not a cheap deck to create. And it's not a deck that's uh, sort of go to what am I going to bring to my first ever tournament? So this is the fact that PyTorch has brought this deck shows that they're either they're in communication with some other players, maybe uh, they're a friend of a tournament player, or maybe they're just very experienced from other card games and look at this deck and say, even though this is a very uh, heavy control style deck, it's a very confusing deck. There's a lots of different plays, lots of different small combos you have to set up. I'm, I'm just confident that I'm going to be able to play this deck well and going to be able to play this deck at a competitive level to beat these other players with. And, um, I mean, it's somewhat similar to Leo's version of this deck, so I'm not sure if PyTorch has practiced at all with Leo, but the other two decks are very different, so uh, I'm not sure. I'd love to find out more from PyTorch and this lineup. Oh, maybe next time you will have a fun stat to, uh, to talk about, as in where he found this list. Because I think to your point, right? Air, sure, no problem. See that all the time. A little bit of Jagro, great. Third list, probably something like the US Frontline. Not overly expensive to create, not overly complicated to play, though it still has its nuances. Um, I definitely think going for the control list is absolutely a, a baller play here, assuming they can uh, they can pull it off. And I guess we will find out. But uh, let's take a flip over to uh, to Birdo's list in the meantime and uh, have him walk us through them. All right. So I'm I'm gonna skip the first deck and go to the second one real quick because Artie's back, baby. Um, <laughs> uh, Maybe not. There are some issues that arise when you try to build Artie in the modern game. Uh, there is more early board clears um, that are run quite a lot with uh, root out and with supply shortage, which is a big issue for this deck. Um, I put in we can do it to sort of try to combat it a little bit. 99th can also do a little bit of work, but it is a little bit sketchy into those decks but what i thought in this tournament was that i was banning britain anyways so i fought into jagro and into frontline it's quite good um and it has some advantages into some of the other control matchups uh compared to self damage which is also another one of my favorite decks um so i decided i would bring it and You'll have to wait and see how well it plays out. Um, I also have a pretty standard version of US 
German mid-range with a few things a little bit different uh, in terms of tech cards. I run two patrols for each of my opponent's Aichi, in <laughs> um, and I run 101st Airborne instead of uh, Stars and Stripes, uh, just because I was thinking I'm most likely banning Brit Air if I come across it anyways, that I felt pretty comfortable making that change to be a little more well-rounded. Um, and then, of course, I also have Brit Air with a few differences, such as taking out Kitty Hawk uh, into instead run a few more copies of things like Air Superiority, which I prefer as my choice of removal. And so you mentioned that your game plan coming into the tournament was to ban Brit Air. Obviously, we're going to find out in a minute anyway. Is that exactly what you did here going up against PyTorch? It, it is what I did here, yes. Okay, so not too much thinking on your side. You just <laughs> tossed Brit Air right out of here. J King, we're going to put you in PyTorch's shoes. You're looking at Birdo's list and you go, hey, that artillery thing, that's weird. I can probably play against that. Um, what what are you thinking? Are you are you then just going and taking that Brit Air ban that has been the easy decision for many folks? Or, yeah, I uh, think I think if you're PyTorch, you just ban Brit Air. Um, I mean, I suspect that that's was his strategy going into this. Um, he doesn't have a deck that's particularly targeting air, so I assume that means he's just going to ban it anytime he sees it. And Audi, Audi into Jagro, it's a very close matchup. Audi into Frontline really matters on if you find a few key cards. Audi into the Soviet deck, the Soviet France control, that's gonna, that looks like that would be a pretty brutal matchup to play uh, for the Audi player. I don't have a lot of faith in this Audi deck. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Based on Birdo's <laughs> chuckles, I have a feeling we know what direction uh, that deck took. But uh, let's take a look at the bands and see if we uh, we nailed it with a couple of Brit Air predictions here. Hey, shocker! That's exactly what happened. So uh, we're gonna see no Brit Air. We will we will see that Artie deck from Birdo. That I am pretty darn sure. And uh, I am curious to see how Pytorch is able to pull off that control list and. Uh, here is our first match uh, in the second semifinal of Birdo versus PyTorch. All right, so heading into match one, it is going to be the Soviet France versus the US frontline. And this is not a matchup you want for US frontline. Um, <laughs> this is, <laughs> I mean, you hear the chuckles from Birdo. He knows it as well. Um, it's this fine. Is... He only has two Scorched Earths. Maybe he doesn't hit either of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one thing. The patrol is very nice in this matchup against cards like First Rifles and cards like Bryansky Regulars. That is another one of these those reasons why uh, patrol Yes, two is, copies seems of patrol right is now. definitely going to be helping Bodo in this matchup. Um, and opening hand, not amazing from Bodo, not terrible. Uh, opening hand from PyTorch is... You are very happy with that hand. You're only running one Bloody Sickle in the deck, so not having a Bloody Sickle is not the end of the world, but you have the Breon Squadron on two, which is going to shut the game down for several turns, and then you have the on-curve first rifles into the on-curve armored train. These are two incredibly powerful cards and incredibly powerful against US Frontline in particular. I, uh, I love how we were really excited to have Birdo here to walk us through his like mindset <laughs> decisions in this game, but I'm starting to feel like his whole mindset was, oh, I'm screwed. I am so screwed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm screwed. Um, one thing I will say about the starting hand is PyTorch also does have two copies of Winter Warfare, which is also really quite a high value card in this matchup because of the 30 seconds that um you are often forced to play early however the if you don't have a winter warfare you're very happy finding the scorched earth because if you can't kill all the 30 seconds you're perfectly fine making them all four operation two one infantries that are just clogging up spots on your opponent's side of the board um i think this is a very good play from birdo here just get some damage in on the briands don't overcommit onto the board you have three units in the front line. This can threaten a decent amount of damage. You have patrol to get through guards. You have two Blitzkriegs. Birdo could pull out a very sneaky fast win here, um, depending on 
what's going to be played here. And I would be pretty shocked if PyTorch does anything other than play an on-curve first rifle. Yeah. I could have made him not play an on curve first rifles Which, if I played 99th and attacked him. Exactly right what first PyTorch first. does, and not only does PyTorch play it, PyTorch plays it on the left side of the HQ, meaning that if one of these patrols comes out, the HQ will still be guarded. If you played the first rifles either between the HQ and the Bryansk or to the right of the Bryansk, it means patrol could come out and let all of these units attack the HQ. However, very good play putting it on the left, meaning that. Uh, it's going to be harder for Birdo to get this sneaky win in, which is looking like a possibility based on his current hand. Yeah, very upsetting. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a heads-up play from a player like Pytorch, who, as you were mentioning, Jaking, doesn't necessarily have a ton of tournament experience, but heads-up play, had the open deck list, took a look, saw what was there, um, and made a decision based on that. Yeah, I... I... I mean, I'm very impressed by PyTorch so far with this lineup, and we're only five turns into the game, but I think his play has been fine, his mulligan's been good. Um, I don't know if he's he's getting coaching, if he's just natural, or if this is uh, to count. Maybe Huey Huey is back to win more <laughs> <laughs> OCCs. Um, I, I don't know, but PyTorch has been doing very, very well so far. And turn five, he can play the Rima, get the Mobilize on the Bryansk, likely just going to be chipped off um can play the armored train armored train is more resistant to um a potential half track however you could die to a um hellcat and unlike the first rifles he does play it next to the briansk and this is because of the change to rima meaning it gives adjacent units mobilize meaning that if he plays it on the left side of the hq um then it's not giving the Bryansk mobilize at all. However, he has seen one patrol come out from Bodo, so he's probably in his mind that, okay, I need to be uh, less worried about this. And the first Blitzkrieg coming out here. I quite like this. Let Bodo clear the board, get some damage in, get another unit to the front line, mm -hmm. and I mean... And up to play around Scorched Earth to, <laughs> compared to a line in which I would play a little slower, use a half track, get some chip damage onto the... If uh, if Pytorch just went AFK this turn, or if he plays Spy Ring and draws with uh, Cult of Colonies, Birdo had lethal. Um, Whirlwind push-up Blitzkrieg was 15 damage exactly. However, Pytorch is not going to play that because he knows <laughs> that uh, Blitzkrieg is in Birdo's deck. He's seen one, but he knows there's a potential second, so he's just going to play the much safer play of Engineer's Armage Train. This is going to get the health total increasing. This is going to grind down Birdo's board, especially considering that, unfortunately for Birdo, there's no Hellcat in hand. I I only run two Blitzkriegs, and I, I was really praying that turn. I remember vividly that I was praying that he just does something other than a guard and other than healing. Which I don't think was too unlikely. Yeah. You um, have seen Rianz, I you've saw seen one... first rifles, you've seen Rima. Yep. However, um if you look at PyTorch's deck, I think there's over ten guards in it. Um he's got the Bryansk, <laughs> he's got the T sixties, the First Rifles, I would try, and 272nd didn't have enough credits for it, but that's in there too. Um, PyTorch's deck is doing exactly what he wants it to be doing. It's, it's slowing down the game. It's grinding Birdo out of these units. But have you considered that it's not what I want his deck to be doing? <laughs> <laughs> Here, just uses the generated light infantry to take out a 30 second and also heal two. This just shows how much how these decks generate value compared to decks like midrange. 30 seconds is a sorry, oh, yeah, go ahead. I do wonder if he drew first, if he would have made the decision to trade the one one into the two two and play one to roll for that turn. It it would have been pretty powerful, although it is certainly less important to get that clear when you have Scorched Earth in hand. And th that is a good point. That is a mistake from PyTorch. Um, playing the Spy Ring first, depending on what he was looking for, there's a possibility that um, there was something he was looking for. I'm not exactly sure what it was, because he got the German research and chose not to play it. But 
playing the Call to the Colonies to draw after attacking with the Light Infantry, definitely a mistake, because as you pointed out, if he had been able to trade into the 90... If he had held back on the trade, he would have been able to hit the 99th Winter Warfare, clear out all of these one health units, and leave the board much more empty. However, Scorched Earth's gonna come down, and uh, that's pretty brutal. It's a big issue. Um, <laughs> and this positioning, again, probably to play around Patrol, but you are getting the buff on a little bit less relevant of a unit um, in this uh, Engineer Battalion. Um, yeah, if, compared to the armored train. If you're PyTorch, you are very happy with getting mobilized potentially onto this armored train because you saw there's no Hellcat that's come out already, uh, and there's potentially no Hellcats that are going to be coming out. Um, you could pretty safely assume that there's not one in your hand, and if for one turn this armored train goes up to a 4 8, then that is no longer dies to a Hellcat, no longer dies to an 8 8 5th Rangers. And that's just going to be so much harder to deal with. And having the Rima just constantly giving that mobilize would be very powerful. And, I mean, this is Scorched Earth. Frodo's eight credits in a aggressive tempo-based deck. His turn eight was to move two units to the front line to potentially attack in the future for an additional eight credits. <laughs> <laughs> And PyTorch, this is why Spyrings are in the deck. He knows he can just... Because it spent 8 credits moving 2 units, PyTorch is just going to spend 9 credits developing research. And so, <laughs> you know, when I drew this one of first Airborne, I was getting flashbacks to taking out <laughs> um, Stars and Stripes for this card <laughs> in the back. <laughs> Oh, it feels so bad. It's not easier watching. Yeah. I hate it. <laughs> and there's there's the there's a few options here. You can blitzkrieg to attack with two units. Um, you can take out the Rima. You can damage the armored trade. That does not feel good at all. I mean, you can dive if bombing I... to double trade to kill Rima. You can half track Rima and attack once. That doesn't feel great either. <laughs> uh, it's these situations where you have so many cards and so many options and every single one you look at looks horrible. That's where I struggle a lot, I find. And if you if you didn't know this, this um, tier 3 Reich research was in hand, you'd be pretty fine just pushing up an 8-8 Fist Rangers. But knowing that if you do that, it's immediately going to get removed and you discard two cards. Um, it means you just have to play it slightly slower, take out the Rima, and... I mean, PyTorch, he can fully clear the board, but he is absolutely under no need to do so. He could just research to destroy this Sherman if he wants to, but, I mean, a 4-3 for 4 operation cost is not too threatening. He decides he doesn't need to do either of those two things. He's just going to play Call to the Colonies, draw another Rima, which um, we'll see if he decides to play it out. He no longer needs to give this Engineer Mobilize since it hasn't lost it. And there's no Flam Panzer in Brodo's deck. There's no easy way to destroy this. There's no Sudden Strikes. Uh, it can be half-tracked to lose the Mobilize, but Engineer's Battalion is one of those cards you really, really do not like to see as mid-range because you don't have an easy way to kill it. Really, without Stars and Stripes, the only way is a strategic bombing and a dive bombing, or a strategic bombing and a 101st airborne. And that requires it to be a 04, which it's currently not. And PyTorch decides to play with the Rima. Um, a little awkward positioning. I'm not entirely sure if the Rima would have given Mobilize to the Light Infantry or not. I do not believe that it does. I think it... Every time I've played it, it has not. Um, but I'm not entirely sure that it's based on the order of play or how exactly that works because i haven't played the deck a whole lot and here birdo is almost able to kill the uh <laughs> armored trade i mean you could blitzkrieg to finish it off um however you can't kill the rima and the armored train, and even if you can, PyTorch is sitting on a board clear, and if he wants, he can actually upgrade 
Reich Research, you don't see it often, but upgrading Reich Research to the Urid project, that's another board clear in his hand if he wants it. And he's certainly looking like he has the time to do that if he wants, because even if Birdo destroys this armored train, finally, um, that's just going to heal PyTorch another two from this Engineers, and this Engineers is not going anywhere. <laughs> Thirty ninth rifle regiment, pretty good. It's a very good card against this deck. Not amazing in this current situation. Um, it's sort of one of those things where, if I start to get back into the game, thirty ninth gets better. So you don't really need it to be good here. I yeah, sort you, of feel like you don't need to play it here, but you're very happy to have drawn it. And mm -hmm. I mean. If he even wanted to, PyTorch could just develop research pass. Um, not necessarily. Well, no, I, I, there's there's nothing in Birdo's deck that really punishes developing research and passing. Um, there's no black watches to make it unplayable. There's no Lancasters. There's no. I mean, like the best thing you could do would be to strategic bomb and to delay it a turn, but that means you're investing six credits into not the board. Um, PyTorch. Decides doesn't want to go for your own project. He's just going to develop the Reich research to get the uh, the U boat, um, and decides to hold off. He doesn't, and I think this is a very good play. If you're going to go for the U boat, I think this is a very good play because the four three Sherman with four operation costs is not a threat um, at all. Half track on the engineers. This means PyTorch will overdraw a card, and he will no longer heal off of Rabugian. Finally, the second Rima. If I remember correctly, I opted not to play the 101st, even though it was quite clean in this situation um, to deal that last uh, point of damage to the Rima because I didn't want to overextend into either Winter Warfare ISU or um, Winter Offensive any more than I was forced to. Although, of course, this is not feeling good either way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you see the Winter of War there, you see the ISU, and there goes Birdo's entire board, and the Engineer comes back onto the board. And, I mean, if you're Birdo, I think you're happier now than you were uh, two turns ago, three turns ago, four turns ago, because now the front line's clear. And the support line's largely clear. You can um, push off. I have dealt right with Scorched Earth. <laughs> In and a sense. Again, unfortunately, because of this U6 or the not U16, but the um the U-boat in the hand of PyTorch, you can't push up the 8-8 fifth rangers, which you really want to do in the situation, because there's not a lot of answers in this Soviet France deck. Um but unfortunately, this if he pushes it up as an 8-8, it'll immediately get removed. Zero credits. And Sherman draws two cards, but there's not any more Shermans in hand, and with discarding two cards um, potentially coming out this turn, he doesn't have to, though. He can just trade into the Red Devils with the ISU. Partisans is just six credits, remove Sherman and Fifth Rangers. And that's a selfish, selfish PIR. <laughs> 39th Rifles to take the PIR. Um... If either of the other ones buff, the 39th is not nearly as much of an issue this turn, but <laughs> that's how it turns out, and it is a and big issue here. He might want to use his defendant. <laughs> 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 you can hear Birdo, the sobs in Birdo's voice. Anybody who has played, been on the American side of this particular matchup. Uh... <laughs> will commiserate with him. And I like this from PyTorch. Using the defensive depth, well, there is still five cards in Birdo's hand, and then you play the U-boat, discarding two, and you leave Birdo with really absolutely nothing. The board I didn't got like cleared. it, for the record. <laughs> <laughs> the board got cleared, and once again, you'd really wish this 101st was a Stars and Stripes. This is... I mean... I also run 101st. I, I'm with... Birdo on this choice, but man, anytime you cut one card for another card, you will know every single time the other card would have been better. You will feel that in your bones. And there's the Petliakov, which means 
even if Birdo somehow takes the front line and keeps the front line, even if he finds the showman's necessary, this Petliakov is just going to be able to completely lock him out of the game. The Apache into the front line, that's not a unit I think we've ever seen in an OCC before. <laughs> <laughs> and Birdo just surrenders. He doesn't even need to see the Petliakov. He knows it's over. And 1-0 lead to PyTorch. Oh, you, you didn't want to drop the Skytrain, Birdo? <laughs> yeah, might get something good. Yeah, might get some Jaskos. <laughs> keep you alive longer. <laughs> Prolong the suffering. Get what? Three of those in a row? Four of those in a row? <laughs> <laughs> and this is definitely the matchup um, you're looking for for Birdo. I think banning air um, and having your air banned, I think you're looking to beat Jaguar twice in a row. So although you've lost a very long and painful game to the Soviet control, I don't think you're, you were necessarily expecting to win that. However, going second against a turn one Befelswagen is also not really what you want to see. <laughs> I didn't love it. <laughs> However, However, the anti-tank gun and the free and regulars are really good in the matchup. Yeah, this is a very excellent hand um, for dealing with Jagro. And Pytorch's follow-up, not great. I mean, you got to hit your opponent for three. However, looking at Birdo's hand, um, Birdo's probably not feeling too much under pressure from just dropping down um, to 16 health. Were, were you feeling under pressure, Birdo? If, uh, if you um, 15th? Well, so not seeing those what he has in hand, I was pretty concerned still. Um, but I... I was particularly afraid of uh, Raiding Brigade because that is really good against my deck. Um, bombing Raid and Desperate Measures also really incredible in the matchup. Um, so that's why I think it takes me some time here to decide between the Anti-Tank Gun and the Briansk Irregulars. Um, partly because of the pressure that's being put down and partly because of the concern of what am I going to do if uh, Raiding Brigade comes down. And I really like this play from Birdo, because if there is Ooh. the Raiding Brigade, um, <laughs> it means PyTorch can't actually attack, and he can't move the Raiding Brigade up. So if the Raiding Brigade comes out, um, which is an entirely a possibility, because this tank gun will otherwise farm the Felswagon, um, it means you're not taking any damage, and then you can play a Breon Squadrament, and you can play it to protect your AA guns if they get out, or any future artilleries you draw, and you're perfectly happy with that. And on top of playing the tank gun, playing it on the left side of the HQ, also correct, because the Breon Squadrament, if it is taken by the Sentai, which is a pretty likely option, um, it's going to then come back onto the right side of the HQ, and you want it to be guarding your HQ against Jagro. Double Arado after the Desperate Draw means PyTorch finds all three orders in his deck, finding the two best cards in his deck against RD plus Fade Retreat. This is... Which um... I think is the third best card against RD in his deck. <laughs> to be fair. Birdo, I don't actually have to check the deck list for this. I could ask you, are you running KV in this list? No. <laughs> that uh, Fane Retreat is definitely the th <laughs> up there. Uh, it's one of the best cards, and we see why the Desperate Measure is coming out, dealing a combined 10 damage, destroying 3 units, and bringing this Breon Squadrament down to just 2 health. Yes, I was mostly hoping that there was... I saw the two Arados. I, of course, did not know that he had a third order in hand, uh, so I was simply hoping that I had a little worse than one in three odds of the desperate measures not coming out against that board, and I would be able to get a we can do it and be in a really good spot. But I do have this recovery, so as long as the... Uh, <laughs> I, I will admit I made a quite large mistake here. I did not hand track, and that means that I did not realize that he has both Bombing Raid and Feigned Retreat in hand right now. Um, if I had paid very close attention and saw where those card went, cards came from, from the Erratos, and which card in hand he played that wasn't from the Erato, I could know for sure that he has Bombing Raid and Feigned Retreat, but I do not at this point. And I'm very glad you brought that up because 
if you didn't, I was going to, and I feel happier <laughs> <laughs> you saying that than I'm saying. Um, however, in your defense, even if you knew for a fact Bobby Red was in the hand, how do you play around it? Like, you just don't <laughs> play cards, and then your opponent is just going to pick you apart with their units. You need to commit to the board and, and to some degree. Um, so, I mean, not knowing the bombing raid was guaranteed in hand is a mistake, but I don't think it would have had a huge impact on the outcome of this game. The Type 93s going to let PyTorch take out this Engineers if he wants. Um, he can also Sendai, the Greyhound, if he wants. It's the largest threat. Um, he can even just go face for six damage if he really wants to. Or he can play Feigned Retreat. He can play any of the cards in his hand, and he'll probably be winning after it. <laughs> so, <laughs> however, he does need to keep keep playing the correct moves, because Artie is a deck that does not need a lot of turns. You just It's very easy for Artie to play out three, four units into the support line in one turn. PyTorch is down the Desert Measures. He's down the Bombing Raid. He can no longer just easily deal with a large number of units in the support line. And if the units stick for one turn, suddenly the Patriotic Firestorms, the Uras, the Greyhounds, the Engineer Battalions, all of these are threatening to deal lethal damage in one turn, very similar to how we saw Blitzkrieg work um, in the Leo versus Noen series. So PyTorch does have to keep playing um, in a way that's going to play around this. He decides to go for the Sendai, remove the Greyhound, keep Engineers on board. Kadayusha is a very good draw here. So, from this point on, <laughs> I would like to admit, I am playing on tilt. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought here, uh, I need to move this up for the 99th. I can't get both the buff from uh, the 99th and the engineers. So, whatever, I'll just move it up and do this. Uh I could have thought more about if I can get a Chika down, um, do things a little differently, maybe not have the 99th come down. I didn't. <laughs> I simply did I not mean... think through all my decisions here. And yeah. we'll we'll see how that yeah. goes. Because you because the engineers offers two attack to adjacent units, you can play the caddy, kill the Arado, and then you still don't you haven't committed to what what your 99th in if you're 99th in this turn. Um so yeah, you maybe even 99th on the engineer is put a 3-6 into the front line, make it difficult for your opponent to deal with it, hold the front line to protect these artists. And double type 93, Akita is definitely not what you want to see. Um Pytorch taking a very aggressive line. I'm not necessarily a huge fan of pushing up the Sendai because the unit under it is a Greyhound, which has Blitz. Um I think Pytorch is much more confident in his ability to close out this game in one to two turns than I am. Because Artie, again, only needs one to two turns. This Feigned Retreat is a really powerful card, but you're giving Birdo a good opportunity to clear your board, and if the you play Feigned Retreat, and the first card off of it is like a key into a Shiden, and you can only play the key, and the Shiden sticks in your hand, you're not dealing anything to the board, and suddenly Birdo's in an opportunity where he can potentially kill you. And this is a very rough position. I feel so under pressure. He's going with such an aggressive line that I feel like I need to use Patriotic Firestorm for one damage, because it means I deal with one more unit on this turn. Which, one could argue, is not correct. I'm not too sure. Yeah, it's difficult to say. Um, I mean, you're not really dead to Shiden either way, assuming you are still taking out one Type 93. And I'm not sure if I, by at this point if you figured out that the card in hand was feigned or not. I uh, had not, because... Well, I knew it was a big possibility, and I knew it was the primary way he wins. But if I hadn't card-tracked before, then I wasn't going I'd to I'd like to point this out. Bruno has lethal right now. This is just lethal. 
So PyTorch needs to draw into things following the feint, and this is what I meant. If you play a little bit too slow, Artie just comes back into it. Beef doesn't do anything. Trident doesn't do anything. Signal doesn't do anything. Trident does do something, James. Oh, that is true. The Shiden does block <laughs> the Pantleacom. My bad. The Shiden does come down and stop the bomber. It stops the lethal. And here, Birdo Which has means a I will certainly be dead on board from the Signal Regiment if this uh, if I do not win this turn. That is true. The Sickle needs to come out. And that's lowering his health total more there's there's the possibility of just hit these two things you go down to two and then you go face you set up lethal for the following turn and you cross your fingers that they don't find a way to deal two damage but that is not a winning play Birdo goes for the winning play which is to play the sickle however now you're going down to one and you're essentially guaranteeing that you're going to die and with the akita in hand we can see this game is over <sighs> But it's not. There's a way back, but I see it too late. There's the possibility I'm... of the Engineers Battalion, which is, I believe, a one in three by this point. Um, and I was like, is my math wrong? Can I kill him this turn? I was so caught up in the thought process. I have two seconds left on the clock when he I finds finally the play it. I do the not... double trade. Oh, dude. I do the double trade so I'm alive, but I don't attack with the Petliakov to get the two damage to face, or to kill the beef wagon. What an amateur. And <laughs> there was way more drama in this game than I was expecting, based on how it started, uh, how it was looking three turns ago. But Birdo kept in it, showing it how Audi can keep him in it. And, I mean, unfortunate that sees the lines a little bit too late, does not sequence, uh, well, not less of a sequencing issue, but just uh, it doesn't issue. get it in in time. And I mean, PyTorch- queuing up the attack as it ended. <laughs> finds the Raiden Brigade, finds the Dino, but neither of these work because of the Patliakov, which means Birdo has five, maybe six damage on board. And PyTorch, he can play the Dina to stop the Petliakov attacking. Uh, which means it will only be three, maybe four damage. And that's exactly what he goes for. Um, pushes up the Befelswagen first, not sure why. And Birdo, his real only hope here was a Ura to go for a 50-50 lethal. Um, actually, sorry, it would be a guaranteed lethal because the Petliakov could still attack to deal the additional damage. Um, unfortunately, that is not an Ura, it's a 99th. You can push up the Engineers. However, the 99th effect does not trigger because of the Petliakov. And... I mean, this game is still kind of awkward. The engineers of the battalion to the front line does clog PyTorch because this bomber can't be traded off. The Dina can't... Well, it can be traded off, but not easily. Um, it is lethal on board. Potentially. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this... This game is really... I mean, the fact that it's still going, I, I thought that I thought this game was over several times. I have to say, um, playing the Aichi, the Aichi does not have Blitz, which means he is once again Pytorch is stuck here. He can trade off the Patliakov into the Kadyusha, play the thirty-five T, but then he can't trade off the thirty-five T, which means there is still going to be a guaranteed. Six damage on board, which means Birdo is going to have a 50 50 for lethal. And several top decks for lethal to bring this to a game three. And PyTorch does open up the possibility of me having lethal 50% of the time here. With the caddy attack to the HQ, if it deals four. Um, then I attack with the Petliakov and the Engineers, but it does not high roll, which means I do not end the game. Um, and it also means that I had already won if Petliakov had gotten it its attack in. Um, the turn I played too slowly and missed it. However, we can do it. Just about the best draw in your deck that is not killing your opponent, and 
also, if you miss the 50-50, your draws are impeccable. They're just enough to keep the game going without letting PyTorch close but it out. The three unit blitz units in a row means that I'm Cavalry dead into to the double bomber face. Yep. All into the engineers to stop any potential healing. And that is going to end it. PyTorch taking it 2-0, but not an easy feat, especially in that last game. Umberto, I definitely, based on the amount you were chuckling pre-game, expected that to go horribly wrong. And honestly, to Jaking's point, there's a lot of action there. Um, you know, it started out a little bit slow, but I, I thought you had a, a swinging chance. And um, that does not seem to be the case. <laughs> Yeah, I I felt absolutely crushed after the misplay at the end. Um, when I watch it back, I reacted pretty quick to do the double trade to keep enough health to stay in the game. So I don't feel as bad as I did in the moment, but I thought at that point there was only one way to still win. I should have seen it. I wasted like 20 seconds and I only needed a half a second more and I had him. Um, so that was that was hard to cope with, but um, it was a very exciting game. Uh, PyTorch played it well, um, and I think a spark from that blunder, I played it pretty well as well. Um, so it, it, it was a very good game. And uh, to be in the top four is already a privilege. But that... Go ahead, JK. But yeah, I was going to say, but that is, that's not the end of your run in this tournament because you're now going to face off your bracket nemesis, Noen, in the uh, third place match. Every time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So um, I will encourage everybody to tune in again tomorrow when we have our grand finals as well as the third place match here for the March Officer Club Clash. Birdo's going to be in action again. No one's going to be in action again. And neither of them are going to be in the finals. It is going to be uh, by Torch against Leo. Sorry, Birdo. That's messed up, Chris, though. <laughs> and neither of them are going to be in the finals. I just relived my nightmares. <laughs> If, if I can't torture you, what are you here for? Um, uh, we're going to have Fly George against Leo fighting for the title of the March Officer Club Clash, taking home all of the points to try and make it to the ultimate here in May. So stay tuned. Or Sorry, not stay tuned. You can turn this off now. Uh, tune in tomorrow, though, where we do this all over again and get you your third place and your grand final.